Hello, this is We Are Libertarians Daily. I'm your host, Dale Melchin, and with me is Hody Johns. How are you today? Doing good, Dale, man. It's good to talk to you. It's been a, it's been a rough, uh, rough few days. Just been really busy at work and looking forward, to, uh, looking forward to just shooting the breeze again with you, man. So I, I'm better now. Yeah, me too. Hashtag me too. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're going to be talking about today, speaking of rough days, is stoicism or learning how to react versus learning how to respond versus reacting in various circumstances. And if you don't mind, I would like to lead this off with something that I told you at the beginning. So this morning I was up doing my thing and I thought to myself, I'm going to get to do a podcast on reacting versus responding with Hody Johns today. The universe replies, Oh, that's cute. Here's a bunch of stuff to happen to help you practice your stoicism and help you to respond versus reacting. And then towards the middle of it, the day, I'm like, dot, dot, dot. Thanks. <laughs> Which initially, the first thing that happened was actually funny. I broke a boot lace and had to re relace the boot. I just laughed. And it was after I cooked up the, uh, the notes for the show. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll just send this over to Hody. I get down to the I get down to the car to leave for work. Turns over, won't start, and spent most of the day trying to diagnose it. And that's where we're at. And half the battle today has been trying to prove to the universe, God, whatever, whoever, that uh, yes, I am indeed worthy of doing this podcast with Hody Johns. See, I, I I love that we're swapping stories here because I actually had a morning too. I can even show you. If you're watching on the video, which you should, by the way, I cut. Look at this. My finger. The light's washing it out. What did you oh, do? I sliced it, man. Look at that thing. I, uh, I, I, well, what I did is I reacted instead of responded. Uh, a drain got clogged at, mm -hmm. at the restaurant, and uh, I just decided to reach down there and clear whatever it was with my hand, and some of it was sharp. And cut my finger because I knew the drain had to be cleared but I didn't think everything through and act safely. I just wanted it to be cleared right away and get done with it. And it came back to bite me right away, which is kind of a perfect lesson for what we're talking about. It kind of bit you right away. Yeah. There, could have been a, there could have been a snake in the drain, Hody. There could, you know, there should have been a snake in the drain. That's what they call that, right? The snake, like where you yeah. stick down. I needed an actual snake in the drain. Instead, I got the snake bite as opposed to the nice fluffy snake that I stick down there and clean the drain out. Right. What so, was it? Was it just a piece of metal that was caught in there? You know, what's funny is I, I never found out what cut my finger because I, you know, after that I took some precautions and scooped everything out there. There was a lot of hard sedentary rock-like stuff. It might've just been one of those things and I was just great, not too hard. But uh, now stoicism, is, I think is a very complex word for something that's not that complex. But if you'd like to explain that real quick before we dive into it, what is stoicism? Well, in a nutshell, and looking from the various sources that I painstakingly looked through this morning, um, basically stoicism is learning not to let the BS of life um, affect you. And, and more specifically, and I think the, the analogy could be used as a, our waves are, are, are waves, our, our feelings are like waves. And so the body that we inhabit and the, and the minds that we have are like a ship. And so and I'm already mixing too many analogies here, but basically the point of stoicism is learning to navigate those waves expertly rather than going into the wave and capsizing yourself into being caught up in all of your own nonsense. Um, you, if that's a, a good way of putting it. Yeah, it, it's sense. really, I mean, I, I think that's as good as an explanation as any. I mean, dictionary definition is the endurance of pain or hardship without the display of feelings and without complaint. It so has when, ties, well, I was going to say, it has ties to an ancient Greek philosophy of the same where mm -hmm. it said that virtue is the highest good. And um, we see this displayed both in modern Christian in Christianity, um, Buddhism, Taoism to an extent, um, and some of the other major world religions, but Stoicism was once its own thing, and it's starting to make a resurgence as well. Um, as you can see, if you just Google Stoicism, you'll have like five or six different actual experts on Stoicism. But. Yeah, well, and, and I don't necessarily, uh, I think pe this, uh, people hear this and sometimes they're like, what, so I'm having a bad day and you want me to repress all my feelings? And it's not that, but I think it's learning to handle your feelings 
you know, I, I think is kind of the healthy way to talk about it, to learn how to channel those feelings. It's not getting rid of them because you, as we know, you can't actually get rid of a feeling. You right. only store it and save it for later. And it's coming out one way or another. That energy's there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you, I, I think the, the best way that I can phrase it is just learning to channel it positively instead of negatively. And, yes. uh, yeah. And, and, and I think beyond that, I think there's an intellectual application as well. Something that I wanted to talk about with the difference between reacting and responding is sure. I think that that's what makes people NPCs. Uh, you've seen the NPC meme, the gray head, where it's just, you know, we don't think for ourselves. I know you get uh, banned from Twitter for using it now, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, for, for calling somebody empty headed, basically, you know, just sheeple. But really, that's what it, for me, that's what it comes down to, is if you just assume, oh, this person's a leftist, I know all these things about them, they're all like this every single one of them is like this and you know and you you put you file them away or this person's on the right so i can assume all these things about them and, and be right about their character you that's when you become a demagogue and that's when you really become an npc and you're really not treating them like a, a thinking person right. you're just treating them as like the culmination of whatever they saw on tv now some people do believe what they see on tv but there's a reason they're susceptible to it, and you need to attack that reason as opposed to just saying TV is dumb. <laughs> exactly. Well, and TV is dumb to an extent unless you get really good quality art that comes from the TV, but that's a, a rarity, I would say. Yeah, uh, Weird Libertarian's TV show is going to be awesome. It will be. It's going to be tremendous. Well, it's kind of, we kind of have a TV show now. And it's, but when we, actually, when we actually get our own studio, it's going to be tremendous, huge. <laughs> it's gonna be huge yeah i uh ladies will do whatever you want when you got your own studio you know <laughs> <laughs> so what's um what's the biggest i guess hindrance that you see to a person to, to people who struggle with this what is it that you see from them the bad the qualities what happens in their lives i would say and, and i'll draw some from some my from some of my own experience today um and a little bit from what I've got here. Um, I think a lot of it's lack of practice. I mean, like with anything you have to, with any type of conditioning, whether it's physical conditioning or training that you get when you're going through a class, you have to practice. You have to practice in the moment, trying to be aware. This is where some like pieces of meditation and emotional intelligence come into play. Um, it's a lack of practice. And so you're presented with a situation and instead of taking that initial two seconds to respond in the case of, well, in case, I'll use a lighter example. In the case of the, uh, the, the, uh, the boot lace this morning, um, I laughed and then I relaced the boot. And, you know, I just, I just went on after that, not suspecting what, um, what awaited me after I'd gotten downstairs. Now getting to the car, that can be a little more frustrating because you have to be somewhere, thankfully my overlords in the daytime are flexible and are fine with things like that happening. Um, but then it's, it's a matter of being, being able to take, take a second and be like, okay, what is it that I can control? It's focusing on what you as the ind individual in that situation can control. For instance, facing off with the car, can I magically bring this car back to life? No, but I do have some understanding of basic troubleshooting. So I'll get on my phone, go to Google, and look into what is what's happening when a car cranks but doesn't turn over. Well, there's several things. It can be the starter. It can be, and I'm not necessarily trying to go into a full diagnostic here of, of how to fix your car, but it, you go through different steps of could it be the fuel pump, could it be you know a battery, that sort of thing, and then you start you know as you're able to focusing on those things that you can control, and eventually, ultimately the one thing that you would be in control of in that situation is being able to take it to a professional, but it can apply, you know, in multiple situations as well, whether you're presented with the person who is rude or unkind. Um, in fact, leading into that, um, this is a quote from Marcus Aurelius from the daily stoic kindness is invincible only, w but only when it's sincere with no hypocrisy or faking, for what can even the most malicious person do if you keep showing kindness and given the chance you gently point out where they went wrong right as they are right as they are trying to harm you by marcus that's again marcus aurelius so you and that 
and that leads to another thing. Stoicism and reacting versus responding doesn't necessarily preclude pointing out uh, where somebody else screws up. It's all a matter of how you're doing it, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. You got the, as managers, we always learn the compliment sandwich. You know, you got the, <laughs> you say something good. You have to say, you know, you get the critical thing out and then you end with something good to leave somebody with a positive taste in their mouths, you know, and, and it's, it's a little extra, I guess, effort and work, uh, but it creates a healthier environment and it also makes it so you're not constantly having to hire new employees because basically you can treat everybody like dirt because you don't have time and then you're going to have to make time to hire new people and train new people. Or you can take a little extra time with everybody you have, make them feel valued, mm -hmm. and then you're not having to do that constantly. It's that react versus respond thing. You say, well, what was I supposed to do? They screwed up. Okay, they screwed up. Mm -hmm. So you could react, which is just saying, you screwed up. Never do this again. You know, and then and then you're going to have to deal with the con those consequences versus responding. We're not saying do nothing. I like the react or respond. We're not saying ignore the bad behavior. We're saying right. re you know you respond to it. You cr you craft a game plan. You talk with them about it. You make it private. You know you you, you establish their value in your life. Mm -hmm. Or I mean, if you have to cut them loose, you cut them loose. Uh, right? Not pleasant, but we have to do that sometimes. But again, that's something that you should plan on doing or just saying, you know, this amount of training is not worth it. It should be a very measured thing in your mind. Mm -hmm. I like the idea that every action is an equal opposite reaction mm -hmm. when I talk about this. So there's baseball. Somebody throws you a hundred mile an hour heater right down the middle. Now, if somebody does that in baseball, at least half of the time with the hitters in today's game, if it's right down the middle, even if it's a hundred miles an hour, they're taking it over the fence because mm -hmm. people know how to hit. 100 even though it's 100 miles an hour they know how to hit a fastball down the middle right so the issue is, is you're not going to get many many people on that but what to the, now let me tell you the difference between reacting and responding if you stick your bat out there without like swinging without pivoting or anything it's just going to knock the bat out of your hands right. and you say well, what was i supposed to do it was a 100 mile an hour fastball i just i it was so hard you know what, what do you expect me to do Too hard, say, hard, yeah <laughs> whereas you understand that, yeah, there's that equal opposite reaction. You pivot that off the back foot and it feels like nothing. You, mm -hmm. Yes, you're still going to experience that when it hits the bat, but it's very different if you're, if you're swinging at it properly versus if you, you know, swing at it and it hits you in the handle and then you got that ringing thing going on in your hands for a while. Right. Now, that's the sports analogy, but the thing is it, it definitely applies to life. You see, I, I know for me, I witness people – all the time. And I think everybody starts out this way. And I want to explore that in a minute. But mm -hmm. you start out saying like, I have no idea what to do here. That ball is going 100 miles an hour or this, you know, life is coming at me real fast. I got these projects stacking up. I got bills to pay. I got, you know, car problems always strikes me when I'm not ready for them. You know, something is coming at me. And mm -hmm. so I'm going to have to either react or respond. I can get mad. I can treat my family bad. I can kick the dog. All these are reactionary things that really aren't helpful in the long run. In fact, most of them create more problems, especially if you have a big dog. Yep. But, you know, what we're going for is a responsive activity. You still are going to experience that hit. We're not talking about the hit not being significant. We're just saying bracing for it properly so that you handle it the right way. Right. And and life is going to hit you in unexpected ways. So I'm not, obviously not everybody's expected to brace for everything, but even in boxing, nobody's trained to never take a hit. You're trained what you do after you've been hit. And so you just understand that these are the training that you need to go through. Say life is going to happen. Here's the way I'm going to respond and I'm going to develop my brain this way. Exactly. It, would you agree with that? I mean, I mean, is that, no, that sound I right? think, I think you're I think you're on the nose with those analogies there. I mean, and it can extend it a lot of a lot of practical areas as well. Um, you, you deal with the rude or unkind person. Uh, you deal with somebody who has a lack of awareness. One of the things we often get accused of as libertarians is our lack of hygiene and being socially dull, which mm -hmm. we're not. Um, but you know, you you're confronted by that person out there in the world who's who wouldn't be either of us. But you know, you you have a you have you you have to choose how to respond to that person. Is it worth you know, is it, if it's somebody you work with, yeah, it might be worth saying something to, uh, to them about how they're behaving or how they're acting. Or if it's just some Joe Schmo that you're having to stand next to in line, it's like, okay, I can endure this for five minutes. And choosing to respond that way by giving a non-response. Um, 
And you mentioned you mentioned a lot of sports there, but even in the situation of if you're facing a physical attack, um, you may only have seconds to think through what you're going to do, which that involves. That's another podcast and another training thing of, of, of its own. But um, you know, sometimes running or negotiating can be can be the best response. Um, fighting only when necessary, and again, you know that if you're going to do that, uh, make sure you, you're the legal the laws on your side and. and or you're on the side of the law rather. And, um, you know, physical fitness is, is key. And although, again, I'm trying to move towards this personally, I'm no, I'm by no means an expert. It's a different podcast. So that's, that's on the negative side of the house. Yeah, I, I, I like it. No, I, I think I use sports analogies all the time, but that, that is the practical application to say, mm-hmm. I need to make some decisions here. I think life is a combination of those things. Mm-hmm. And not to use another sports analogy, but in football, rarely do you see the running back just run headlong into the defender or run the opposite direction of the defender. Most of the time, those are really bad ideas. Mm-hmm. They usually go diagonal. They say, I'm going to take a little bit of a hit. I'm going to slow a little bit down over here. Um, it's going to, it's like a hybrid between running, between running away and taking the hit, you know? And I think that that makes its way into life. You kind of have to say, you know, sometimes I got to run away a little bit. Sometimes I got to, you know, get ready, to get hit on the chin a little bit. One of the things that I did want to talk about in this, I know you said, and maybe this is even what you're talking about that could be a whole separate podcast, but I really wanted to bring up here was um, the idea that, this is not an intellectual thing. Smart people can react instead of respond all the time. It's right. a discipline thing. Yes. And it's something that does require a lot of discipline. One of the books that's made the most big, the, made one of the most biggest impacts in my philosophy is this book called Idiot Brain. It's just by this journalist. It's not really political. It's just talking about, um, about what our brains do. And very smart people learn patterns very quickly. Right. So, Dale, if I say one, two, three, blank, what's the blank? Four. Yeah. And so you recognize after three numbers, we measure IQ by how quickly you pick up patterns. That's the IQ test is when right. you take one, they say, how good is he at picking up these patterns? How quickly does he respond to these? So we actually train our brains as we grow up to, to assess faster mm-hmm. and, re- and react faster because that makes you smarter. The right. trouble is, is that can't, that, that does have the side effect of saying you're rewarded for how quickly you react. So for example, if you are stiffed by five elderly people in a row, mm-hmm. what is your brain is going to tell you happens with the six elderly person? They're going to stiff me. They're going to stiff you. So should I give them good or bad service? You should give them absolutely horrible. Ser- no, you should still give them the best service because the, yeah, because they, they may be to- someone totally different. Right. It, it's, it's, it tra- but that's why you trained in these prejudices. You know, I was reading about these guys who scored really high on the IQ test, and one of them's a really bad racist. And the reason being is because he just says, you know, hey, everybody who looks like this color is, is problematic in the club, you know, versus everybody else, you know, all these people of this color mostly are good. So what he's got is these patterns that train his prejudice, that, train, tra- that have created this racism for him. And it's because of his IQ and not his in, in spite of his IQ. Now, I'm not telling you the smart thing is to be racist. I'm saying his intellect led him down this racist road, which is why it's not an intellectual problem. It's a discipline problem. You need to tell your brain early on, hey, I need to take a time out right now. Right. I see the one, two, three. I need to take a breath before I say four you know, for sure. Now in math, obviously, you know, we still want those patterns. I still encourage people to go down an intellectual road. I'm not, I'm not encouraging stupidity, Mm -hmm. but what I am saying is there's times when you need to say, I'm going to take a second before I treat this person just because all other people, I I had a really bad problem with women for a while after my divorce. I know that's normal. Uh, Even though it's a pattern of one, one woman I was married to, she treated me badly. So what, therefore all other women on the planet must also be awful, right? You know? <laughs> well, what I was gonna say to that, well, what I was going to say to that is, I mean, that's a severely weighted situation. Your experience of your of your ex wife, you know, that's weighted against, you know, that brings the 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 scale down in terms of your experience of of other women over time, and it's you know taking you time to, to get over that and and take care of that. So 
you know, don't be too hard on yourself. Yeah, absolutely. To use another sports analogy, I mean, there are times in your life you're going to, you got to go 0 for 1 and you're going to strike out. So what mm-hmm. do you do with the next at bat, same pitcher? Just say, well, the pattern is I just strike out every time. So I guess there's nothing I could do about it. No, yeah. you, you get after it the same way you, you try to do with every hit. It's one of the things that I like about you, Dale, is you're always talking about fighting hard. It's okay if there's a failure. You acknowledge that it was a failure, but you get back up. You cheerfully persevere, fight on, keep going forward. It's something that you encourage on your Simplistic Advice podcast, which I think is great, that, uh, that I think is something that people need to embrace more. We need to take that time out to say, okay, look, I know things are heading this direction, but let's take some action so that they don't keep going that way. I think exactly. we, we look at, otherwise, everything's just a mathematical inevitability, right? We see, we've seen the pattern, and then there's nothing we can do to change it, you know? Even, and I think that there's something to be said for when you look at why elderly people don't tip or why, you know, this stereotype behaves this way. I don't like talking about that because people get offended and get their right. feelings hurt. Um, I, for example, don't like, I mean, there's a plethora of white people calling the cops on barbecues. It's embarrassing, you know, and and it really is like, I mean, when people know, like when people talk about Karen, right. When you yell at the hypothetical Karen, like everybody knows that's a white person you're yelling at, you know, (laughs) and, and it's embarrassing to be associated with some of these stereotypes. I think they're worth looking into because you need to say, why is it that way? So it's not that the entire, I don't believe the exploration is worthy. We should Mm -hmm. talk about cultures and how race plays into that culture and how we can, keep the healthy parts of all of these cultures and abandon some unhealthy ones. And we need to be able to call them healthy and unhealthy. Right. But I think the more we associate them with color of skin, the intelligent people out there are also going to turn into the bigots pretty quickly. If we don't rationalize it, tell them to take that extra beat. Um, I know we're kind of running low on time and I did want to give you the last word. So I guess I'll just take mine now. But I did want to say, uh, so I had a friend uh, come in from Japan. He was an intern and uh, was just studying over here. And we were talking and I I was talking about the culture over there and some of the differences. Now, I hate it when people associate like a whole country with one culture. This could have just been this guy's like city or community. I don't, I'm not saying all Japanese culture is like this. Mm -hmm. But what he said was hard was when we talked to him, Um, he said the hardest thing about being over here is you don't get a second after somebody speaks to respond. Right. And it's, it was important to his family and his community that he was in to went to hear something, to kick it around in his brain for just a few seconds before responding. And we're in this culture where you're trained for speed, especially in the podcast business. If I have three seconds of dead air, that's bad. You know, that's why this is a really bad place to, learn new things <laughs> or, or just, you know, this is a great place to dispense information, but podcasts are kind of a tough place to say, let me think about that for a second because you only have a second. The audience is sitting there listening and waiting, right. you know? And so you have to have, have these discussions outside of it and beforehand uh, because, because, you know, you can't have the dead air on air, but in your, in your human life, I think we should encourage more of, I, I really liked what he said because it encourages us to respond instead of react. I think when I react, especially in politics, I see Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and my brain is automatically in a place, this person's going to say something idiotic, right? (laughs) Now, it's like that because of patterns. I have seen her say, say, say idiotic things. Here's the thing though. I need to time out with my brain. First, understand that a lot of my friends like her. I am from a for whatever reason, my school, my background from the place that I'm from, they were just more left-leaning people. So a lot of my friends like her, share her stuff, right? Share her positive stuff. The stuff that my community shares now is very different from the stuff that the <laughs> Alexander Ocasio community shares, you know? And so it's, it's all very different. And, and so I need to say, one, are all of my friends just stupid? Mm-hmm. I already know that's not true. Right. So two, let's move on. Let, let's, let's not be a demagogue. I don't want to separate that them out of everything. So, okay. So, so let me, let me rationalize this. You know, number two, why do I think she's going to say something stupid? Well, I've seen her say X, Y, Z before and all those were dumb. Okay. But how much, I mean, she is very well covered. She says a lot. 
So if she says a lot and I take away, you know, 0.1% of what she says and meme it and make her look stupid. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, probably 0.1% of what she says is stupid. 0.1% of what I say is probably idiotic as well. She called it what the three chambers of government. Man, I've done that before. I've said something stupid that it wasn't actually. And I was like, Wait, that's not technically what they are. They're branches. You know, everybody does that. I've probably done it this podcast at some point. And somebody's going to say, that's what that's not technically called, Cody. You know, and so it's like, am I really harassing her for the right things? Or am I just so triggered and ready to go on her when I see her face that I'm going to decimate her? And then three, I can't rule her out on being useful sometimes. Uh, even if she is wrong, even if I think she's wrong 99% of the time, why, why toss out like that 1% of the good ideas she has and use that as a unifier? Mm -hmm. I want to say, man, this was Bernie Sanders. So we're going to switch people that are, that usually automatically trigger me. Mm -hmm. But Bernie Sanders was the one other politician with Rand Paul. They actually co-sponsored the balanced budget amendment. And, uh, Bernie Sanders just wanted to make sure that what uh, healthcare didn't get touched, which I agree with because we have to pay those doctors back somehow. You know, there's a lot of budgeting we have to do, but ultimately we're already behind in payments to doctors. If we reduce the payments every year to doctors, it's just more we're going to have to pay back later. So that bill that he co-sponsored with Rand Paul, I can say Billy, Bernie Sanders was an ally to balancing the budget at one point in this country, mm -hmm. which I think a lot of libertarians don't know because they don't want to know it. You know, it, it's just information that doesn't feel good because it is right. funny to make fun of him. It is 99% of the time he's wrong and it's funny to see him be wrong. But let's not throw out some very important babies with that bathwater, even if there is a lot of bathwater, you know, right. I, I think. And so those are the three things for me when I say, okay, time out. I can feel my brain go this direction. Let me put it on pause. Let me assess it for what it is. And let me put it in perspective and then move forward for there. Now, maybe you still do make an Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez meme. It's just, when you say something totally boneheaded, you're going to get memed. And it right. happens, and it's funny, and we should laugh about it. And we should also use these experiences. And I'm not saying never correct your friends. When I see my friends who are big AOC fans, who are big, like huge on the Green New Deal, I'm just like, you know, it's okay. It's appropriate for me to be like, hey, I understand that you want job security. I want job security too. Do you think it's appropriate if we never fly in a plane ever again to get job security? Because most of them are going right. to say no. And so now instead of a, being a bigot who just hates everything she is because of who she is, I've talked about the issues and I've got my friends thinking about it. You know, I, I was, and, and I hate to brag, I'm one of the libertarian trailblazers in my family. My whole family outside of two in the last, in the last, uh, family reunion we had they're libertarians now right and it's because they trust me to not be a bigot and i've talked with them like people nobody starts as libertarians but you know i i help blaze the trail and i give them a way to follow me instead of just destroying everything that they're at and i think that's how this becomes political i don't want to dismiss all the important real life applications because i know i tend to make culture stuff political and i'm trying to stop which doing you just that. which you just did for the last several minutes Tony, yes which okay. i just did for the last several minutes but this, <laughs> this is how it happens this is how it manifests itself in these politics and so i guess to wrap up i'll just say imagine how that also if that's if that's how it affects your politics it's also affecting your personal life and yes. you should think about that too so, Dale, uh, I am completely done. I will just give you the last word, and when you tell me to stop recording, we'll stop recording. You got fired up, bud. I got to yeah. point that out. Um, <laughs> I guess to speak to some of what you said, um, and then I can start winding it down on my side of the house, um, I think a lot of that comes with I, I think a lot of that comes with just cultivating the discipline of having a rational mind. I mean, the memeing and the making fun of it. I got into a dust up in the, se in the secret room with somebody the other day because like, listen, they're politicians and they're running for office. They are asking to be hazed and lampooned and, and all of this. And I still stand by that. But you're right. It, the thing of it is you have to take the approach that when they, when they stumble upon truth, we should recognize that. Now, it would also be disingenuous if we ignored the other you know, 99% of the problem. I mean, that, you know, whatever their, their philosophy is, but to not get political, but I did want to speak to and address what you said. I think you're right. And I think it comes down to learning to be rational and 
recognize um, doing the dead air thing, sorry, um, respond versus react and think about what's being said and think about the humanity of the person as well. But um, on the practical application side of the house, um, two things I want to wrap up with. Now, we talked about people. Um, stoicism can also apply to circumstances. Again, you want to focus on the things that you can control rather than not. Um, you even want to deal with this um, in terms of when good things happen, because with pattern recognition, we, we have something good happen to us, whether it's somebody is kind to us or, you know, in my case, you know, you, you bid a really big job and you get it, or, you know, you get picked up by, um, by a, by a network, um, you know, something along those lines, you, you want to celebrate the victory, but you need to keep it in perspective. So that way you're not bound to those positive feelings. Cause what happens if you, if you, if you fly too high in terms of your feelings, same thing with a jet, your engine will stall, um, or something will, will cause, will cause a crash. And so you need to keep that equilibrium. It's not about, and I, I got into a dust up with, um, somebody else it wasn't really a dust but it's a friend of mine who leans left and is very much into psychology and says well i just think stoicism is theologically off base and i'm like yeah um, you read the bible you, you bear up in all circumstances that sort of thing um and i i just kind of told him you know it's it, it has to do with not repressing your feelings but um but learning how to manage them like we talked about earlier um and then the other thing you want to keep in mind along the stoicism side of the house is arising thoughts from the past or regret. Um, the, the main key with that is learning to recognize it's in the past. You can't do anything about it. What can you control? And that's what you're doing now and what you do in the future. And that just also has to do with, you know, emotions generally ask yourself, what would be the result of acting on this? You know, if you have a bad feeling arise within you. Um, and if the result is a clear nap violation or, um, or something more that's a generally a net negative, you should learn to gently push that feeling away. Um, and we've barely hit the, the tip of the iceberg on this, but this is just some, some tools that you can, these are just some tools that you can use to um, create a more stable frame of mind to, again, keep the thing, keep, same thing I keep coming back to is just getting after it and going, um, going after what you're at, going after your goals in life. And I'll um, close on this by learning uh, how to choose to choose how to respond. We buy time for ourselves to act on things appropriately. Learn to liberate ourselves, which is the key here. We're trying to liberate ourselves on a personal level from the capricious nature of our feelings. And as I mentioned in the opener, we become like the expert captain on the rocky seas, navigating life successfully for the benefit of ourselves and others. And keep in mind, learning to think and to live like this is a process. You're not going to get it right the first time, but it's in the doing and the discipline that you're going to have access to all those tools and be all the better for what you do. So that, those are my closing thoughts, Hody Johns. Awesome, man. Well, uh, guys, I appreciate you get, tuning in again today to uh, me and Dale. Uh, those are some great tools. I'm glad that you got to that because I just realized at the end, I was like, I didn't tell people how to do any of this. I just told them the problem with it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah, uh, take those tools, run with them. Dale, I'll let you say goodbye to everybody. Goodbye, everybody.